Welcome to Boston University Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation. Today we are having a second of two conversations with Judy Chamberlain, world leader in the mental health consumer survivor ex-patient movement. Speaking with Judy is Dr. Mary Ann Farkas, one of the center's directors in charge of training and technical assistance on a national and international scale. Hello, Judy. Hi, it's great to uh, be doing this. It's wonderful to talk to you. Um, I'm going to forward some slides as we go along. Um, just to set the context of these interviews, we're going to, going to have two conversations with you. Um, the first is with Bill Anthony, and it's going to talk about the historical record of the movement, where we've been, where we are, where we're going, and that will be in a separate interview. This particular interview that we're doing today is going to focus on the philosophy, the values, and the international growth of the consumer survivor expatient movement. And I want to thank you very much for being willing to go through all this. Oh, I'm delighted. There's a picture of me doing the interviewing, and here's a picture of you, advocate, educator, author, researcher, activist. Didn't know all that about yourself, huh? <laughs> okay. Um, so before we start talking about the movement and its growth, I, I just wanted to take a minute and talk about the philosophy and values of the consumer survivor movement. and. You and I, Judy, have gone around the world together for the last 20 some odd years promoting the recovery and rights of individuals with lived experience. And I think we've been able to work well together because we were philosophically aligned with each other uh, and believed in the rights of citizenship for all people with whatever labels they carry, like temporarily abled or disabled or whatever. And I'd like to talk a bit about what those basic values are underlining the consumer survivor movement, and then how you see the possibilities of partnership between what I call fellow travelers, or those of us without the experience of a psychiatric history, and consumer survivors. So if you wouldn't mind first just talking a little bit about how you see the basic values underlying the consumer survivor movement, now we can move on to the possibilities of partnership before we go into the details of the international um, growth of the movement. Okay, and I think that's an important place to start because uh, a lot of times I read in the professional literature things that claim to be, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> claim to be having a dialogue, but where they haven't worked out those points, and you see as you go on that they're really in very different places. But right. very often the professionals want to start with treatment. What's the best treatment or what's the optimal treatment? Or how do we get people into treatment? And that's starting in definitely the wrong place because the, the underlying values uh, aren't shared. And our underlying values are around personhood, uh, around freedom, choice, um, uh, and options so that the issue isn't uh, – what kind of treatment you should have, it's what kind of life do you want to lead, and what are the services and supports, one of which may or may not be treatment, that would support uh, your choice as to what kind of life you want to lead. Absolutely, and I think some of those values are, are difficult for some people to align around because, as you said, people think that they are committed to them, but when push comes to shove, they find themselves perhaps um, saying things like, well, I, I believe in self-determination except. Yeah, this, this particular person in this particular situation. And, and there are certainly times in, 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 in any kind of organized society that people lose their, their right to make a choice. And, and, and those largely have to do with violating the, the written or codified rules. Uh, unfortunately, in the mental health context, it's often the person has violated unwritten rules. Right. You know, you stand too close to people and yell in their ear, you haven't violated a law, but you make a lot of people very uncomfortable. Absolutely, and I think that's why I like to talk about the citizenship aspect, because Absolutely. we're talking about the same rights and responsibilities that any citizen... That everybody else has. It's not special. 
It's not right. different. It doesn't give you the license to be, uh, you know, to bop people over the head and think, oh, I, I'm mentally ill. I, I can get away with that. That's, that's a very irresponsible approach on the part of uh, a person who has a mental illness label to, to their right. But if they're just doing things that are considered odd, and I know people who've been committed for, you know, wearing the wrong kind of clothing uh, or, uh, you know, other things that they're thinking of as an expression of their individuality, um, and other people are saying, well, that's obviously some kind of symptom of mental illness. Right. Right. And it's a simple message, but it, it has been, at least I, I venture to say in our experience, exceedingly difficult to transmit that um, message uh, from from what people think they believe into uh, how they behave in practice. So I wonder, having said that as the basic value system that we come from, um, if you might say a few words about how you see partnership between um, those of us who do not have a lived experience and those who are within the consumer survivor movement since Many of us, as I said before, feel that we're fellow travelers um, trying to promote the values and vision of recovery. Well, I, think it, it, I think it starts with, with, um, with dialogue and rec finding out where the points of difference are and, and, and being respectful of them. You can work with people that you don't agree with about some of the details and if you, if you agree about the fundamentals and if you are clear about well, here's an area where we're not going to agree, but we can work with it. But I think a lot of people are kind of start, sort of paper over the, the differences, and then that only leads to things getting all muddled and confused. Right. So let's be clear about what our values are and where we agree and where we disagree, and always be able to respectfully disagree with somebody. Right. And, and I think that that's one of those those um, characteristics of partnership that grow over time. Because I remember in the early days, uh, early days being in the late 70s and early 80s, where the differences were what we saw rather than the commonalities. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and, and it's learning how to, how to work with people who don't agree with you about everything is, is, is hard. I mean, and, and, and yeah, it's extremely necessary. If you only talk to people who agree with you about everything, then you're only talking within a small closed circle. And when you widen the circle and say, well, let's bring in people who don't share all these same experiences but are, are at least striving to develop a common value, um, it's going to be hard sometimes. And it's going to lead to a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, people getting huffy and people walking out of meetings and people having to learn how to respectfully disagree. Mm -hmm. It's much easier, you know, to say, oh, that person's just an idiot and I can never talk to them, and say, well, there's a person who seems to get about 85% of what we're talking about. Let's see if we can work with that and, 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 and recognize that, you know, there are some differences. I think that's one of the um, advantages that we have when we've worked together over time. It's kind of a maturation process, I yeah, think. development of trust. Right, exactly. Okay, well, with that as a backdrop, um, as I said, you're going to be talking about how the movement has grown in the United States uh, with Bill Anthony. So I'm not going to go into that with you now. I want to focus more on the movement in the international community. You know, I've seen in my own travels that the belief in citizenship, the access to citizenship, full participation, whatever that means in each and every country, are some of the common beliefs that have allowed us to work across cultural boundaries. So I'd like to ask you how you see the international movement um, at this point. What, what is the reach of the consumer survivor movement at a global level, and, and what's been your experience in general? Kind of amazing that we're talking about this right now because uh, uh, I think it's one day later this week, I can't remember exactly, that the uh, uh, World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry is opening their uh, international conference 
um, which has always been held in, in a Western or Westernized uh, society. And this one's going to be in Uganda. Wow. And uh, has representations from uh, a number of groups in, in different African countries. Uh, and then, of course, all the countries that we've worked with over the years in Europe and uh, U.S., Canada. Uh, we've got some participation now from Latin America, um, Asia, uh, at least uh, I know India, and uh, at the last conference I went to somebody from Nepal. And one of the things I'm going to be very interested in hearing uh, about the conference in Uganda is how many uh, countries were represented. But even the last one that we had in uh, um, in Denmark, we had 10 African countries, and we had over 50 countries altogether. And that's very different than it than it was even 10 years ago. Oh yeah, it was really just touching, uh, uh, like I said, the very Western and Westernized part of the world: U.S., Canada, Western Europe, uh, Australia, New Zealand, right. um, and Japan. Although it's not a Western country, it's sort of economically, at least, uh, very similar to, to those countries. Well, I'd like to take a moment, if you don't mind, and, and focus on um, some of those areas of the world that you've been mentioning and just get your reflections on um, the evolution of the consumer movement in those areas that, and your experience um, with how it's developing and maybe some of the ideas about why or how it's similar to the values we've been talking about or differs. And the first um, area that you mentioned was Western Europe or Europe in general. So do you have any comments about the growth of the consumer movement in Western Europe and uh, where it is with respect to the movement in the U.S. and its value system and the Yeah, and there have, been, there have been, as with the U.S., there have been groups that have been really strong for a while and then um, kind of disappeared and then it pops up somewhere else. So that, for example, 20 or 25 years ago when I was first doing international work, the strongest groups were in, were in England and the Netherlands, and uh, uh, although there's still activity in those countries, there wasn't the really high level of activity that there was then. So it kind of ebbs and flows. And uh, why do you think that is, Judy? Uh, I'm not sure. I think uh, I think some of it it's just all of these groups have been, especially when you're talking about groups 20 years ago, very small, and either unfunded or underfunded, so a lot of it is they're just burning out key people. Yeah. People just uh, getting tired of doing this. So um, but but the the um, you know there 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 are uh, I, I I'm not don't mean to say that there's nothing happening in, in England and Holland now, but there certainly is. But at one time those were pretty big groups comparatively. Right. They were um, the leaders. And is the union of or the network of European survivors still in operation? Yes, it's it, it, the under the uh, organization of the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry. There is a European network, and there are attempts to develop that regionally for each part of the, of the world. Yeah, but the European network I think is the strongest one, the one that's been around the longest. So when when you reflect on on the ebbing and flowing in Holland and England and, and maybe in some of the other countries like the Scandinavian countries where certainly the consumer survivor movement was funded and very codified, unlike um, Holland and England. I yeah. wonder if you um, can identify any learnings that sort of pop up in your mind when you think about their evolution over time. Well, I, it's been my my experience that, not just in other countries, but in the U.S. too, that groups can die from too little money and groups can die from too much money. Right. Uh, it has to be a sort of a natural, organic kind of growth. You can't go from having nothing to having a budget in hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, smoothly. It doesn't yeah. work that way. And it tends to create, create a lot of um, infighting and sort of, you know, who's got the money and who doesn't. Whereas if it grows sort of slowly and organically, there's a lot more opportunity to build consensus. Right. I've seen recently a lot of sophistication in the consumer movement where they kind of resist the um, attempts by funders to, um, you know, set us all off against each other by coming up with cooperative proposals to share money rather than, you know, we're going to get it so you won't kind of attitude. Right. 
I think that's a maturity uh, uh, indication of, of organizational maturity. Right. Um, but I think that, that certainly groups uh, need funding, need adequate funding. Um, one of the uh, things that, that uh, the, the expectation that because just because somebody's got a psychiatric history, they're going to be willing to work for free or willing to work for uh, meager wages uh, is an indication in itself that we're not taken seriously. Right. And working in any kind of uh, service structure or organizational structure uh, is work. And right. the society we live in, work is valued with, by paying people. Well, uh, if, sorry. Of course, it runs up against uh, people who are living on social welfare benefits who usually have restrictions on how much money they can earn. But these are all problems that can be worked out. And ideally, you create career ladders where people would get off um, social welfare benefits and be just live on a salary like most people do. Right. Um, when you think about the highlights in the European um, consumers survive towards uh, full equality for consumer survivors, are there any particular highlights that come to your mind, victories that were won or um, roles and positions that developed in Europe that maybe didn't in the United States or, or maybe did and just demonstrated that they were transnational? Well, I think uh, some of the European groups have been very successful at using humor as a way of of getting their issues across to the general public. Uh, I, I know that the uh, group in De Denmark, there was a group for a long time called the Danish Mad Movement, which very proudly embraced uh, a kind of, um, um, you know, outrageousness and, 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 and you, you know, uh, were, you know, being a kind of a mad fried ideology expressed through uh, a lot of art and cultural things. And I think recently we've seen a lot of that in Britain as well. There's one group that does a, um, uh, they push somebody, they get a big giant bed, and they put somebody in the bed, and they push the bed, uh, for, you know, to, 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 to the town, to the mental hospital, and, uh, um, you know, and kind of create a kind of a fairgrounds atmosphere and use that to educate the general public right. about what these mental health issues are like. <laughs> That's the... Uh, okay. uh, and recently now, of course, with the, with the web, you've got all kinds of things that are being done on the web. You've got uh, webcasts and, and uh, um, participatory things um, done through this whole new medium. Well, I, um, when, I, when I think about it um, from my perspective, I think some of the things that I learned from the European consumer survivor movement uh, may have been different from what you learned because you knew more about it, but I remember when you first told me about MIND and um, some of the groups in Holland developing the advanced directive. Um, I, mean, I think there's been... Cards. There's been a lot of that that started in Europe that has now uh, begun to happen, I think, in the United States as well, and the idea being that just like a living will that people sign that says, you know, if I'm ever in a coma, Here's what I want. Uh, you know, I have an untreatable medical condition or whatever. Here's what I want, or here's what I don't want. And the same kind of thing where people can say, if I'm manifesting a certain kind of behavior, here's what I would like people to do to help me. And and equally important, here are the things that don't help. Right. Because it's so individualized with people. I mean, some people want a lot of space and quiet, and some people want a lot of people around them. Right. So it's not just knowing what the average person might want, because there is no such thing. It's knowing what this particular person uh, finds beneficial or finds uh, harmful, so that you can make sure to, as best as possible that, that when they're in a state where they may not be able to communicate all that well, um, that this document will kick in and they've thought about it and they said, when you see me doing this, these are the particular things. Play this kind of music or, you know, make sure I uh, lie down and sleep or to be anything. Right. These are the things that I find comforting and helpful. And it may or may not include certain medicines or certain treatments. It may be purely uh, things that can be provided by non-professionals. It depends on the person. 
Well, and, and I think that's a good example, as you said, of one of the ideas that came out of the consumer survivor movement in Europe and got disseminated back to the United States in that direction. And often we think about it going from the U.S. to the other countries, but this is definitely something that came from Europe and went went to the United States. I, I, wonder I remember if, meeting, <coughs> right. excuse me, meeting an activist in, in uh, Austria, and she had hers on a laminated card that she wore around her neck. Right. She wanted to make sure that if anything ever happened to her, this, this thing was going to be with her. Are there any other developments like that that you can think of that came from Europe before we go to the next area of the world? Um, let's see. Nothing specific is coming to mind at the moment. I'll probably think of other things later as we move on. Okay. Well, you know, feel free to mention them even if they're not about the continent we're talking about. Um, next, we're going to go to the Pacific Rim and Australia and New Zealand, where there's always been a lot happening. Yeah. And, and I, I wonder if you care to reflect on some of the developments in Australia and New Zealand and what your experience has been in general uh, with the consumer survivor movement on that continent. Oh, I, cer <coughs> I certainly remember the first time I went to Australia. I think I've been there three times, maybe four. Um, and um, it is a long, as you know, Marianne, a long, yes. exhausting trip. 24 and hours, if I remember oh right. Oh, God, when you get out of the plane, you're just sort of, you know, where's the bed? Bye. Uh, yeah. so I, uh, I, I get there, and I go through getting, getting my luggage and all that, and I'm met, met by a group of people that I've been corresponding with. Uh, in those days, it was all mail and phone calls. There was no web then, or not, not for ordinary people anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, being just so exhausted, getting into a car, driving toward the city, and after about 15 minutes, we're all just chatting away as if we've known each other because the the experience of, of, of being labeled with, with a mental illness and being subjected to institutionalization and drugging and all of those things is such an amazing commonality and that, the, you know, societies differ in so many ways but the way that people experience psychiatry just doesn't seem to differ that much any place that I've ever been or met anybody from. It creates an instant bond. Because you start talking about your experiences, and they're, they're the same. Yeah. Um, I remember one trip when I went to Japan and uh, sat down and met with a group of people in a, in a, in a user-run social club. And they had, I had somebody translating because uh, a lot of people did not speak English. I, of course, don't speak any Japanese. Um, and uh, what they said was that when, when we go into the hospital here, it's very hard because we're just not regarded as people. And nobody listens to us and nobody respects us. And we can't get the simplest things we ask for because we're just not taken seriously. Uh, and... In the structure of Japanese society, that's very common for a lot of people to feel a lot of different things. Japan is a very authoritarian, top-down kind of society where people are kind of expected to do what they're told. Uh, very conformist, very, um, you know, people wanting to be like everybody else. Uh, and yet, you know, that, that was this overwhelming experience that they had, so it's, you know, apparently even more so. Uh, in a society that values conformity, even more so when you become a psychiatric patient. Right. And then well, the that's, both, that's both the heartening and the disheartening. Yeah, but then the next country I was in was Sweden, which is, you know, you think of as the absolute polar opposite of Japan, a country that's very uh, egalitarian, at least in its um, social... Um, social structure? The, the image that they want to put forth them some, for themselves is, is that they're, you know, everybody's equal, nobody, <coughs> um, very flat kind of hierarchy. Uh, so I sat down with a group of Swedish patients in a hospital, actually, and what did they start saying? They said, when we're in the hospital, we can't get what we want because nobody listens to us, nobody respects us, nobody takes us seriously. 
right? Like the exact same words. And it was just so incredibly striking because here's these two societies that are so different. And here were people experiencing the psychiatric system in those countries in exactly the same ways. Well, as I was saying before, I think one of the things that's made it a little easier, both in a heartening and disheartening way, for you and I to go around the world and talk about recovery and try to promote the implementation of some practices that we think affects recovery is exactly that. You know, people say to me, well, how, how do you have the nerve to go to, you know, such far-flung places as Singapore and Europe and um, Australia? And I say, well, because there is this commonality, just as you're saying. People, despite the cultural differences, have a very shared experience of what their life has been like as a psychiatric patient. Yeah, it, it, just, it just is so amazing that, that it, it just really seems to to have been grafted onto culture, very different cultures in exactly the same way. Right, transcendent. But if you think about Australia and New Zealand, um, and you'll see on the slide there's a picture of Mary O'Hagan, I wonder if you can talk about what you think are some of the advances that Australia and New Zealand have contributed in the consumer survivor movement. I think they've done a lot of work with uh, uh, with drop-in centers and, and uh, client-run services. And they've also done a lot of work with people um, actually getting roles in the mental health system. Mary O'Hagan was, uh, was uh, on something called the Mental Health Commission, which is with, with the language kind of got it's hard to translate into our context. Because when we say mental health commissioner, we mean the person who runs uh, a mental health system. But the mental health commission in, in New Zealand was, I think, three people who kind of had general oversight uh, responsibility, uh, 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 kind of an ombudsman kind of function, I guess, huh. would be the closest thing to do it. To, to, to it. Um, and, so, and people taking on not just roles that were niche roles for, for let's, let's hire a, an ex-patient over here, but actual roles that could have, could have been filled by other people who didn't have the lived experience. Um, uh, Chris uh, Hansen in right. England, um, uh, was part of the official delegation of the, of New, of the New, New Zealand government to the negotiations on the United Nations Treaty on, on Rights of People with Disabilities. Uh, so, not, again, not just, you know, fit, fitting in these sort of extra roles and saying, oh, let's hire an ex patient over here, which often falls into this sort of, isn't it, aren't we wonderful and progressive? We have, a, uh, we have an ex patient working for us, but they're not part of the whole system. They're sort of off in a corner somewhere. Right. Where and what do you think it was about Australia or New Zealand that contributed to that level of progressiveness? I think, I think those are also societies with pretty flat hierarchies mm -hmm. and kind of a very down-to-earth uh, uh, <coughs> general societal mores are very much, you know, kind of practical and down-to-earth and we don't put on airs. Right. That's, that's kind of the Australia and New Zealand uh, uh, persona. Of course, it happened in New Zealand and I don't believe it's happened yet in Australia or has it and I didn't know. Uh, to a certain extent, um, I think I think uh, it's happened more in New Zealand than Australia. Right. And blood is because New Zealand smaller. Right. Smaller, uh, but city, I, more tight knit. Yeah, but I think that the last time I was there was what almost two years ago now, and uh, uh, there was certainly a lot of excitement around different funding decisions that people were expecting to come through that were really going to fund things on a meaningful level, not just little little dips and drabs of money. Okay. And people being actively involved in um, helping figure out where the money was going to go. And um, I saw a lot of a lot of excitement when I was excitement there. about the level of responsibility and the impact okay. that, that could, right. things were poised to take off in a lot of different places. Uh-huh. Now, on the Pacific Rim, and we don't have a picture about that, I know that you've already, you've also been to countries like Indonesia and... Oh, I haven't been to Indonesia. The only places I've been are Hong Kong and Japan. Hong Kong and Japan? 
I thought you'd been to Indonesia, or maybe you just had contact with them. Oh, we had we met those people from Indonesia that came and gave us all that nice stuff. Oh, that's right. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, all those nice. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it was wonderful of them. But that's the reason I thought that you went. Facts and things. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you've spoken a little bit about the movement in Asia. I wonder if there's anything else that you would like to say about China. But on Japan. I've since met a few of the activists from India. Uh, I haven't been to India, but uh, in India uh, they sort of face two problems, and one is that there is some of the worst of Western mental health in the form of large congregate hospitals, but the other of which is this, that there's this reliance on um, folk healing and stuff like that, that a lot of People in the West tend to romanticize, but what one of my Indian colleagues told me is often unbelievably horrible, and people people getting sort of chained to trees and left there. Huh. So that we have to be careful not to put our romantic Western eye and say, oh, if you just make everything go back to traditional healing methods, everything will be fine. Right. Um, and she said that families will turn people over to these um shaman or I don't know what the word is that they use there, and there's no legal oversight over it, and mm. awful things have happened. Right. So, so you kind of have to keep your eye on both of those things. The but simple lack of hospitals, which sometimes we take to mean a progressive society, doesn't always mean a progressive society. Right. A progressive response to mental health services at any rate. Yeah, and, 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 and that she said that really awful things go on in these informal settings that there's no real oversight. Now, um, and, and what what would you say is the strength of the consumer movement in Southeast Asia than India? Well, that, 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 it, that it's, it's uh, developing a, uh, an indigenous space that's, that's led by people who've uh, experienced the system and, and and are trying to expose these, uh, um, you know, all these problems. Uh, that is, despite all the difficulties, an actual consumer movement. A lot of times, when you hear that there's a consumer movement someplace, you go look closely at what they mean. They mean a family movement, right. and there certainly is a family movement in India. But there also is a, a movement of people who've had the labels themselves, um, and they're doing. Uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but I know that I got some of their newsletters and stuff, and they are they are trying to grow these organizations and, and, and develop a, uh, a presence <laughs> so that, that they're, again, the, the, the first issue always is to be heard, to be taken seriously, to right. become part of the discussion. And to be present at the table. Absolutely. And you, you said uh, a few minutes ago that you have been to Hong Kong. And, and that, was only one, that was only one trip. Uh-huh. Do you have contacts um, with folks? I haven't maintained ongoing contacts there, so I don't really, I don't really know. And, and you know, the further a society gets from, it's hard to go to a place like, and you know this, Marianne, from being there a million times, Sweden, which right. you think we we could get our heads around. Right. It took us. Probably long. have understanding how society works. Right. Uh, so a place like Hong Kong. I think unless you spent, uh, or, or many other places that are so culturally different from us, I think unless you spent a real lot of time there, it's kind of presumptuous to, uh, uh, to draw any conclusions. But I did find that there were uh, people who, uh, you know, organizing uh, self-help groups and things like that. Well, I uh, think that's were very the excited uh, right. by the things I had to say. I think that's the important point, Judy, that even if we don't know a great deal about these uh, groups, at this moment, we know that they exist. Exactly. And, and that, there was a time not so long ago when uh, there were very few and far between. Right. And then, when you, and then when you talk about what their ideas are, their ideas just seem to mesh real well with what groups are doing in other parts of the world. Right. Well, let's end, end this sort of uh, whirlwind tour around the world with uh, some of the developments in Africa. Do you want to say anything about... Um, the growth of the consumer movement in Africa? Yeah, I know that the, when we had the, the World Network meeting in uh, <coughs> uh, in Vancouver, and that's got to be 
I don't have the dates in front of me, maybe seven years ago or something like that. Um, I think we had ten countries all together. When we had the World Network meeting in in, uh, in Denmark, and that's, I guess, something like three years ago, uh, there were 50 countries, wow. ten, of, ten of them in Africa. And now wow. the, this meeting that's just going to be starting next week uh, is in Africa. And I'm, like I said, I'm looking forward very eagerly to seeing the list of, of what countries were represented, but it's going to be more uh, than we had then from, I think, every part of the world. A real exponential growth. It really is, and really, you know, gives, gives uh, 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 shows that this is not just a um, Western rich country idea. Right. It's, it's growing organically every place. And, and I get the impression, I don't know about you, but the, that the um, growth of the Internet and access to technology has really helped that. Oh, no, there's, there's no question. There's no question, but that's, that's helped. And the other thing that's helped was the process of developing the UN uh, Treaty, the UN Convention on the Human Rights of People with Disabilities, because there was active input from a coalition of worldwide disability groups representing all kinds of disability. And that group um, was an opportunity for people with psychiatric disabilities to be seen as equal to people with other disabilities in, in speaking for ourselves, representing ourselves, and also served, I think, as a, um, I think there were three different meetings over three years for the, 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 that the General Assembly was meeting to talk about this issue, and that this co people would come together in, in New York from different countries to work on it. And it really led to a tremendous uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Increasing understanding on the part of all the different disability groups, what other disabilities we're dealing with, and a real, um, and in a lot of, I've noticed in a lot of the African countries, the uh, ex-patient groups often seem to be developing as allies or part of or segments of uh, an overall disability movement, mm -hmm. which I think is a much more natural home than to develop out of a um, psychiatric reform movement led by parents or professionals, which is what has happened in a lot of Western countries. I think those groups have a lot more trouble really becoming truly independent. Do you want to say a few words about why you think that's so? Because I think well, we haven't had a chance to think about the implications of the growth of the movement through cross-disability efforts. Because when, when, when you're growing in a cross-disability context, everybody shares the experience of being seen um, as a person who is lesser than the norm, uh, and some of the discrimination that goes on in, in against people with physical disabilities in, in, in many parts of the world that I learned about through going to some of these UN meetings, it's just frightening. I mean, people whose um, births never get registered so that they don't officially exist. Oh, my God. Therefore, you know, can't get any kind of services because they don't exist. Oh, my God. Um, and as sort of... Uh, reluctance on the part <laughs> of some societies to acknowledge that that they have these kinds of problems by not registering the birth. Oh. Or, in, or in, in Eastern Europe where uh, all the countries that used to be communist, part of the communist ideology was that basically the disabilities didn't exist. So they would build these institutions where people with all kinds of disabilities, physical disabilities, mental retardation, mental illness, whatever, were just sort of thrown in. And they were always built way out near the border of the country, like, let's push this as far away as we can. Right. Now, and how do you think that that, you said that you thought that that was an easier um, platform to begin yeah. with when than start starting in the mental health family. world um, as a, a family organization or a mixed organization? Yeah, when people are organizing around, well, we've, we've been discriminated against, uh, we've, uh, We've experienced this uh, uh, institutions. We've experienced not being able to get um, education or being restricted in, in our citizenship rights, like the right to marry. Um, there's a strong commonality there, and people see this as a the necessity to fight this as a human rights problem. Whereas if you if it grows out of a sort of let's make mental institutions better. Uh, kind of ideology, which is often started by progressive professionals and family members, it's very hard sometimes for the 
people who've actually been patient to break free and, and, and be just more than just sort of an adjunct to that, to that uh, uh, kind of organization, which isn't primarily based on rights, it's based on services. Right. And the, the roles are different, too. They're perceived in, as being in different roles. Absolutely. Right. That's, what, that's why I think the, uh, uh, the model that, that, that uh, has psychiatric disability as, as in growing in coalition with people with other disabilities is a much more sustainable model. Okay. And that seems to be what's happening, certainly in Africa. Well, we're coming to the end of our time together, Judy. I wonder if you have any final thoughts or lessons learned from yes, make me helping as to I make have these slides. <laughs> Pardon? I said yes, make me as young as I am in these slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, it does say making a difference. <laughs> people who are in countries perhaps where the consumer movement is not yet strong or where people are thinking about developing the consumer movement whether they or helping to develop a consumer movement whether they are a fellow traveler such as myself or a person uh, with a psychiatric history themselves do you have any um, Yoda like words of wisdom well I would certainly say you mentioned earlier about the web but use the web Get in touch with organizations like the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry um, or uh, Mind Freedom International, uh, and we can provide the web addresses, I'm sure. Um, and, you know, link up with what's happening and, and, and use this incredible medium that, that lets us communicate so easily, which we certainly didn't have in the early days. Um, work with a core group. This is something that you need um, at least, I would say, uh, half a dozen people or so, uh, not just one person because they're going to burn out. Um, uh, work on the issues that are most pressing in your particular uh, area or region or um, and, and the people who know that are the people who are living it. There's no... There are a lot of places you can take a bite of the apple, and there's no one right place. The right place is what's, <coughs> what's the most pressing for that particular group of people. It's all, it's all the same apple, but, but you grab onto it in different places, and that makes right. a lot of sense. Uh, and the issues that are important to people are issues that will make people feel passionate and make people want to do this kind of work. Uh, because it's about, it's about, the issues are about improving their own lives and improving the lives of people like them. And for those of us, as I said, who are fellow travelers committed to the overall mission of recovery, what advice would you have for us to be uh, supportive as possible? Be helpful but not too helpful. <laughs> Do it. You know, give, give support. Come in with an attitude, what can I do as a, somebody who hasn't had this experience to be helpful to you rather than here's what you should do. Uh, provide practical support. Sometimes people need help with a place to meet or uh, <coughs> uh, photocopying or um, snacks for a meeting or, you know, those kinds of very practical things. Um, offer your expertise, but don't expect that um, you're going to be the, the leader or the group is going to do what you want it to do because um, that's not your role. So be supportive and get out of the way. Exactly. Uh, and on those uh, words, I'd like to thank you very much for spending the time today sharing your thoughts and ideas, Judy. I've enjoyed it, and I think this is uh, a topic that needs to be needs to be looked at because uh, – with all the changes in the mental health system over all the years that I've been doing this, I still see too many people who are uh, not, don't, <coughs> not given a real chance for recovery by the system. So my hope is that if we get together again years from now and have another conversation like that, we will be able to say, and that has changed. That would be very nice. 
Okay. Well, signing off now. Okay. Uh, I'm Mary Ann Farkas at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation at Boston University. Thanking Judy Chamberlain for her time and thanking uh, NIDER and the Center for Mental Health Services for their support for this interview. Goodbye. <laughs>